afternoon viewers uh, this is deepak naik from health and new therapeutics welcome you for this webinar conducted by neuroendoscopic society of india monthly webinar series 6 in uh, today's webinar we are conducting speeches on endoscopic lumbar dissecting indications and outcome endoscopic treatment of lumbar canal stenosis indication and outcome in relation to open procedures and percutaneous endoscopy of spine pros and cons can you see my slides yes yes yeah this webinar series is coming to you through a digital initiative of health and you a joint venture with new link company limited japan we have a vision of fulfilling unmet medical needs by launching innovative first time in india products for example amnurite amitriptyl plus mecobalamin in 5 10 and 25 strength for neuropathic pain and for migraine uh, we were the first one to combine uh, amitriptyl plus propranolol when migraine is not responding to one drug amnurite beta 520 er and 1040 er Uh, we also have amnurite p the first pharmacological combination of combination for neuropathic pain with two neuroanalgesics pregabalin is given in a sustained release form to match pharmacokinetic profile of amitriptyline our mecobalamin injection is imported from exactly. japan this is the one and only made in japan mecobalamin injection for neuropathic pain to give you 100% mecobalamin we have also launched a 2.5 mg strength of clobazam which was not available in the country and many pediatric neurologists neurologists requested for this strength so add clobaz 2.5 5 and 10 are available in mouth dissolving form to add flexibility and control to your epileptic uh, therapy we have recently launched a new concept vitamin therapy for migraine brentamin recommended by american academy of neurology and american indic society riboflavin and magnesium both come in group 2 of their recommendation and brentamin contains both riboflavin and magnesium 200 mg 200 mg each and coq10 so brentamin a vitamin therapy for migraine uh, till now we have conducted uh, more than 40 plus webinars and all the webinars are available on our dg neuro channel on youtube so we request you to go through uh, the youtube and just type dg neuro and you will get host of seminars uh, conducted uh, through uh, health and you dg neuro initiative including all the webinars uh, conducted by endoscopic uh, uh, society of india uh, you can go through the webinar this webinar also will be uploaded in a day on this uh, channel so please subscribe for more information on latest webinars on this channel i have now great pleasure in introducing Uh, dr suresh sankla who is who has conceptualized this webinar series for neuroendoscopic society of india uh, professor dr suresh sankla is a consultant neurosurgeon in mumbai he is a president of current neuroendoscopic society of india he has been past president indian society of pediatric neurosurgery past president indian society of neuro oncology past president of bombay neurosciences association past president of skull based surgery society of india chairman of communication uh, asian australian society for pediatric neurosurgery and uh, he is on executive board of international federation of neuroendoscopy so sir uh, welcome to the webinar thank you which has been your thank you which has been your brain child we also have professor ashish patak uh, who is actively uh, conducting this webinar with the help of dr suresh sankla professor ashish patak is director of neurosurgery fortis hospital mohali chandigarh former professor of neurosurgery uh, in the prestigious pg uh, uh, pg uh, postgraduate institute of medical research chandigarh former consultant pediatric neurosurgeon nhs uk sheffield former lead vascular lead pituitary and skull based neurosurgeon nhs uk kingston past president of cerebrovascular society of india honorary secretary of neuroendoscopy society of india former honorary ec member Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, former honorary EC member of Indian Society of Neuro Oncology. 
so i have great pleasure in handing over this session now to professor sankla and uh, professor ashish patak sir please carry on thank you yeah ashish please go ahead thank you first of all i must thank uh, dg neuro for helping us uh, to give this platform where we are conducting this series of webinars and i believe it has evoked a really very exciting response amongst the uh, all the fraternity who are interested in neuroendoscopy i have to thank dr suresh sankla who came up with this concept and i happily sir join hand with him and i'm i can see that the webinars are running in a very beautiful manner today uh, we are here to start the most exciting topic of neuroendoscopy of the spine which has been a long awaited uh, topic which was uh, to come through first of all i invite all the members of the neuroendoscopy society of india all the non members and also i believe there would be foreign uh, neurosurgeons who would be participating in the seminar so i welcome them all to uh, participate and join with us Uh, the topics today are very very exciting uh, the speakers are also very eminent in, in their fields uh, professor satnam chawda will be talking on endoscopic lumbar discectomy versus microsurgical discectomy indications and outcome and you know uh, dr chawda is chairman of uh, department of Neuro neurosurgery sir gangaram hospital delhi uh, further introduction will be given before every talk of the speaker uh, Professor Oitel is chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, University of Saarland, Hamburg, in Germany. He is going to talk of endoscopic treatment of lumbar canal stenosis, its indications and outcome in relation to open procedures. Uh, Professor Sukumar Sura, who is a very dynamic uh, endoscopic surgeon, who comes from Hyderabad, uh, from Asian Spine Hospital, will be talking on percutaneous endoscopy of spine pros and cons. amongst the panelists uh, we have uh, again equally eminent persons who are uh, well known in their fields uh, the first of all i start with uh, dr srinivas rohidas who has got a great uh, uh, expertise in this field he started endoscopic spine surgery a distended technique in 2002 and then he did endoscopic posterior cervical spine surgery 2005 started anterior cervical disc preservation surgery jos technique in 2006 and he has been using the ultrasonic bone dissector uh, which was probably uh, manufactured by him in 2010 he has done 3d endoscope for spine surgery 2017 for the first time in india and he has been conducting innumerable number of workshops and demonstrations at all indian institute of medical sciences neem hans bangalore chandigarh bhubaneswar outside india in france germany malaysia japan south korea indonesia seychelles punjab jeddah and so on so the list is endless so welcome uh, professor roidas uh, and as a panelist uh, to us and again uh, dr sumit sinha who also is well known in the indian uh, neurosurgical fraternity and always also abroad he is a minimally invasive and endoscopic neurosurgeon spine surgeon and peripheral neurosurgeon and director of neurosurgery and spine services paras hospital gurgaon he is ex professor department of neurosurgery at aims and he is a cerebrovascular and spine fellow in germany japan and brazil he is a education officer of ao spine faculty of atls founder secretary of indian society of peripheral nerve surgery is secretary of neurotrauma society and he is member of the wfns committee on peripheral neurosurgery now he is his primary expertise and interest is in minimal access spine surgery wherein he performs complicated spinal surgeries with minimal incision with the purpose of less pain and trauma to the patient his surgical training of course tells how he has really been grown by eminent persons like professor hirota sano in japan professor k uh, kano Japan, Professor Louis Viele in Brazil, and Professor B. Meyer in Germany. He is an accomplished researcher with several scientific research projects under his name, under the uh, national agencies like ICMR and uh, Department of Biotechnology. And he has been a keen investigator. He has got 250 publications and a lot of collaboration with various uh, departments. And his research work are really into the molecular level going into the neurotrauma and of course in, into various other fields so i welcome professor sumit sinha 
to this uh, webinar as a panelist. And the third panelist, no less, uh, is Dr. Professor Rashim Kataria, who is Professor of Neurosurgery at SMS Medical College, Jaipur. He's a fellow of the neuroendoscopy. Uh, he is a fellow neuroendoscopy of University of Greifswald, Germany. He is member of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, member of various uh, executive committees of uh, Indian societies. His special interest is CV junction surgery, neuroendoscopy, and vascular neurosurgery. He has been awarded a traveling fellowship in Washington. He has received the best paper award in 2012. He is an Emerging Medical Scientist Award from National Academy in 2017. And he was also awarded the designation of Outstanding Faculty Award. He has got innumerable publications in this field and a clean, in, uh, very keen interest in neuroendoscopy. With these few words, I mm, request uh, the president to give the permission to start our webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pathak. Uh, let us start uh, the seminar and please go ahead and invite the first speaker. Right, it is again my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my friend and an eminent endoscopic surgeon, Professor Satnam Chavda, who is the chairman department of neurosurgery at Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi. He is uh, one of the very early or probably the first, if I'm right, uh, Sanjay Gandhi, uh, uh, ex-graduate from in MCH, postgraduate in MCH from Sanjay Gandhi Institute. And his special interest is that he started neuroendoscopy since the year 1999 and has used the neuroendoscope for various skull base interventricular and spinal procedures. And if you can really be amazed, he has mastered the technique of neuroendoscopic disc surgery and has performed 1,800 such operations. I mean, that's a very awesome number. You have to really acknowledge that. And with very low complications and excellent results. He has designed a new innovative medical device, which is Endospine Plus, which is also called Satnam's device. And this is a very safe, economical, and simple. I've got one of that. And this technique has been published in ACTA Neurochirurgical in 2019. So you can see his feet, and he is recipient of Best Scientific Program Award, recipient of Distinguished Service Award, BMJ finalist in Healthcare Innovation, Time Health Awards. He has got membership of various important societies, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons USA, Neurological Society of India, Neurotrauma Society of India, Stereotactic and Functional Society, and he has got also innumerable publications. I therefore have the pleasure to invite now Professor Satnam Chawla to start his deliberations. Dr. Chawla, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patak, for the nice, kind introduction. Thank you, Professor Sankla and Professor Patak for inviting me to give this talk on endoscopic versus microscopic discectomy. Can I share my slides? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. If you can come a little closer to the mic, it will be good, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay now? Yeah, it is okay now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is okay. Right. So I am going to speak on endoscopic lumbar discectomy versus microsurgical discectomy indications and outcome. Before I go to the main topic, I would like to briefly touch upon the history of evolution of this surgery. Because as Henry has said, Henry, a photographer, has said that the past is the mother of the future. So it's very important to know how we have evolved in endoscopy disc surgery and what future lies there. So first, uh, disc surgery was performed by Crosse and Oppenham in 1909. And actually, they performed this for a case of Coda Equina. And what they removed was actually a disc, but they didn't know this is a disc and they reported it as a case of chondroma. And it was in two years later that Goldweight and Middleton, they described herniated disc, herniated disc pulposus as a reason for sciatica. That was in 1911 reported in New England Journal of Medicine. Then Mixter and Barr in 1934, they presented their case series of surgical removal of herniated discs. And it was reported in New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, they performed a laminectomy. And then they went transdural 
to remove the disc. It was Love in 1939 who reported interlaminar approach to discectomy, and he performed an extradural approach for that. And then in 1977, two stalwarts of neurosurgery, Professor Yazargir and Professor Kaspar, both in the same year, 1977, independently reported their series of use of microscope in disc surgery. So micro discectomy was born in 1977, and it was they reported in a same journal in the same year, same volume. You can see, and uh, it was reported by them. Simultaneously, but independently. Then Hijikita in 1975, he reported first percutaneous nucleotomy, but it was reported in a Japanese journal, so it was unnoticed in Western literature. And then it was Kambin in 1986, who reported his series of percutaneous discectomy and described what is known as Kambin's triangle through a postulateral approach. Anthony Young in 2003, he applied transforaminal approach under continuous irrigation, what is known as arthroscopic approach, and uh, and then Newton from Germany in 2009 reported used the same technique under irrigation through interlaminar approach. It was 1997 that Foley, Kevin, and Smith they reported microendoscopic discectomy. And he designed a special trocar and endoscope through which the surgery was performed. It was marketed by Medtronic. And Professor Destendo in 1999 he reported his device, where he made a conical tube with three channels in it, and uh, with four millimeter telescope. It was in 1999. Then Ortel, Professor Ortel, who is supposed to be here, probably he's coming. So. He published his device in two thousand nine. Easy go first generation. In Acta, it was published. I started uh, endoscopic disc surgery, and uh, I learned it from Destendo in two thousand three, and started using his device. But then uh, I realized certain limitations, and so I modified this device after about hundred cases in two thousand five. I modified it. To a simpler device, which I'll tell you a little later, and this was published uh, in 2019 in Acta. I named it as Endospine Plus. Our professor Mazhar Hussain has also published a device for endoscopic disc surgery in general neurosurgery in 2005. Now, so from history, you can see the lumbar disc has surgery has evolved from laminectomy and discectomy to open interlaminar discectomy. to micro discectomy which later became gold standard for this uh, treatment and then transforaminal endoscopic discectomy and micro endoscopic discectomy and you can see from this in the whole evolution has been just the minimalization we have not repaired the disc we have we still remove the disc what we were doing 100 years ago only thing minimalization has taken place can you hear me properly Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Uh -huh. Right, right. So I am going to talk about microendoscopic discectomy. But before I go to my my topic of microendoscopic discectomy, I will share with you a few interesting articles about micro discectomy. Micro discectomy, as we all know, is the gold standard. And uh, sorry. I'll show you this uh, Cochrane review of 90 and 2007 about surgical intervention for lumbar disc prolapse, and here the authors have concluded that micro discectomy gives broadly comparable results to open discectomy. That means long-term results of open discectomy and micro discectomy are same. There is another comparative study, prospective randomized study to compare micro discectomy and micro discectomy. and here also it was published in 2006 not very old and they also concluded that there was no significant difference between two surgical procedures in frequency of use of analgesics or post operative was a score for sciatica so they concluded that for lumbar disc herniation both macro discectomy and micro discectomy are appropriate as long as surgeons have history of the pain 
So there's another paper published in the British Journal of Neurosurgery in 1996, controlled study study of microsurgical versus standard lamination. And here also they have come to the conclusion that use of analgesic medicine and the presence of pain in back or leg post-operative was same and not significant difference between two techniques as far as outcome. So basically, uh, long-term outcome of uh, microsurgical discectomy and open discectomy have been same, except some technological advancement and ready acceptance for that, and the procedure has become a gold standard. Now coming on to endoscope versus microscope. As we all know, the advantage of endoscope over microscope are that uh, you give a small incision through which you can introduce your endoscope. Endoscope gives you a wider angle of view from, then inside you can see much wider area. It gives a far better magnification than microscope. In fact, endoscope works like a microscope in the operating field and it causes lesser trauma to the normal structure. The only disadvantage is the 2D image which you get with it while with a uh, microscope, you get 3D image. And this limitation you can overcome by practice and more learning. This is just to show you a pictorial example of difference between endoscope and microscope, how it makes a difference. Like if you want to go for a foraminal or extra foraminal disc here, and you want to see this area, under microscope thick vision, the light goes parallel. So to see this area, to see this area, you will have to make a bigger opening in the skin, bigger muscle retraction. And then to see this area, you will have to remove a bigger chunk of bone, maybe the complete facetectomy to look into the foramen extra foraminal area to perform discectomy. While in under endoscopic vision, you can make a small bony removal fenestration here. You don't need to remove the facet completely, you don't destabilize, and you can perform a uh, remove a foraminal or extra foraminal discectomy. So collateral damage is reduced under endoscopic vision. This is just a pictorial demonstration of microscopic versus MED. In microscopic, we gave a bit larger incision. You strip off the muscles from the spinous process and the lamina, put a self-retaining retractor. So muscles are under constant stretch. And then under endoscopic vision, you perform a fenestration in the bone and then discectomy. While under endoscopic, this thing, tubular endoscopy, you give a small incision and through the muscle, you introduce a tubular retractor. This doesn't produce a much retraction of the bone, no much necrosis. And then through that, you either use an endoscope or microscope as people are using and then perform micro discectomy and the tubular vision. So coming on to the various trocars which are available for endoscopic disc surgery, Metrix, Descendo, EasyGo, as I told you. Now I'll go one by one. So this was introduced in 1997 by Kevin Foley. And this is basically hollow cylindrical tube which comes in uh, two diameters and two lengths. And it accommodates a three millimeter angle telescope. It needs a fixation device, and then you perform the surgery. So it came with a big uh, bang then, but then people were not very comfortable because of the probably due to three millimeter telescope, the video quality was not very good. So people were not very comfortable. So they started using even Kevin Foley started using trocar and then a microscope. So they called it tubular microdiscectomy. So, and uh, then this just end of tube, I started using this tube. This is a conical tube with elliptical shape in uh, transverse section. The advantage of elliptical shape is it docks direct foot on the lamina, even if there is a facet hypertrophy. So docking is much better. And it uses a four millimeter telescope. This is a channel for the telescope. The video quality is very good. You don't need to fix it. You can move it up and down as with your movement of hand and instrument. So it's relatively easy to use. I performed first and 100 surgeries with this, but then I found certain limitations in learning. Number one was that these channels, this channel is for the suction. This is for the working instrument. And the problem is they move in a fixed direction because these channels are very small and then instruments move in a fixed direction. You can't change angulation between them. And at some point, they will collide with each other. So like if you want to use suction and carison punch, so maybe you'll have to withdraw your suction a little bit and then you can't use it simultaneously, you can't cross it. So that was limiting the learning part. Maybe after practice, you can, or with practice, I could also learn that, but that was a bit of a learning problem. 
and you can't cross your instruments like you do under microscopic vision that you can't do it under this so uh, i thought why should we have this solid component why not make it hollow like metronic tube and uh, it will be easier you can cross and the second point is that uh, this diameter is quite big so incision would become about 2.5 cm so even microscopic surgeon can do it under 2.5 3 cm incision so again the advantage of incision is so this but this is very economical system and then you need a special bipolar forceps and all for this thing so i this is what i modified i made it smaller in diameter it is about two third of its uh, maximum diameter and it is hollow from inside it has got four component outer tube and an obturator inner tube which is accommodates a telescope of 4 mm and a self retaining retractor this is how after it's it is assembled in the tube so you can use your instruments really you can cross your instruments angle and change the angulation so surgery becomes look more like microscopic or transnasal surgery and you can do it and uh, it moves freely it doesn't require any fixation it uses 4 mm telescope you can use your normal bipolar normal knife so you don't need any special instrument just this device and telescope and camera system and it is very economical so i found it very useful for last almost 15 years or more than 15 years now i've been using this more than 1800 cases i've operated with this without any problem and this is what i showed my publication in uh, 2019 easy go system is uh, easy go to uh, hotel modified it further in early 2014 and this is cylindrical and it accommodates 4 mm telescope which was a limitation with metronic system they were using 3 mm so here video quality has improved i believe this is a good system but uh, i've never used it maybe when uh, hotel joins he will explain it little more now coming on to the indication of microendoscopic discectomy microendoscopic discectomy indications are same as that of for microdiscectomy all type of lumbar disc diseases can be operated uh, like sequestrated disc contained disc migrated disc central lateral far lateral disc canal stenosis single or multiple level so you can operate anything with this technique now coming on to the positioning the patient earlier i used to patient position my patient on a wilson frame and it's a back little convex but then i realized that probably this position is better with a natural lie of the natural concavity of the back and uh, two bolsters one under the chest another one under the pelvis and uh, this reduces the extra dural bleeding chances of dural tear and this is the position where you can achieve the best decompression for canal stenosis because canal stenosis is maximum in uh, uh, extension posture so this is the best you can achieve uh, in canal stenosis so i like this position so nowadays i use this position I used a the stando localizer device to pull up back the level of uh, disc, and then a small incision is marked about 10 to 15 millimeter from the midline on the side where you want to go, and you make a cut in the skin in fascia, and then put your scissors through the muscles close to the spinous process, touch the spinous, touch the lamina, and there you use a osteotome to strip the muscle from the lamina, and then introduce this tube, and. Uh, this is how the tube is used free hand doesn't need any fixation tube is since the endoscope is fixed with the tube so it always follows the tube and uh, the tip of your instruments are always under vision never a blind area and you can use a drill carison pan pituitary knife bipolar everything through this tube you can see this is quite easy to use and quite stable no problem this is just an external view and uh, so just a small incident and this is the endoscopic view of uh, l5s1 discectomy on the left side and uh, you can see this is the medial this is the lateral this is the cranial and caudal this is the lamina lower edge you perform the fenestration this is the ligamentum flavor you go up to the attachment of upper limit of ligamentum flavor free the ligamentum flavor then gradually remove it and this is the exposed dura and the nerve root going down traversing nerve root here the nerve root is being retracted and this is the bulging disc 
under the nerve root. You can see this is the buzzing disc. So an aneulotomy is done with a normal knife, 15 number blade. And then with a normal pituitary ronger, you remove the disc. Like it is done under micro So Basically the procedure is same. You can remove the disc as per your philosophy. You can remove just the free fragment or go into the space to remove the disc as much as you like. So there is no limitation. So now the nerve root is free. And this is to show how a drill is used in this device. And you can notice that I'm just holding freehand the device and how stable it is. The drill is being used, suction is being used, and uh, tube is hardly any movement. Tube is quite stable. You can just move as if you want to see immediately, tube moves also. So you don't have to really release the fixation and waste time there, up and down, medially, laterally. Really, you can move the tube and use a drill for fenestration. This is contralateral, sorry, contralateral decompression and all that. Everything can be done. So this is a video of par lateral disc. L4, 5, you can see this is a par lateral disc here, extra from them. And so instead of interlaminar approach, this is the lamina on the right side, L4, 5. And this is the lateral edge of the pars. Normally we go intralaminar here. Here we go intra, inter transverse approach. This approach is known as intertransverse approach for par lateral disc. And you perform a small fenestration here on the lateral edge of the pars interarticularis. And then you expose the exiting nerve root because par lateral disc it moves up and presses the exiting nerve root, the ganglion on the exiting nerve root, and it is a very painful condition. So after fenestration, you expose the lateral edge of the ligamentum cavum, remove that, and then you expose the exiting nerve root. This is the exiting nerve root. And these far lateral discs are generally free fragments in the axilla of the nerve root. You can see this is the nerve root, and this is the axilla. You can see there is a free fragment there. So, very minimally invasive stability is maintained. Now, the nerve root is free, exiting nerve root. Okay. So in last, uh, since 2003, I've operated more than 19, nearly 2000 cases, more than 1900 cases, out of which endoscopic discectomy in nearly 1500 and 438 canal stenosis. Endoscopic discectomy age ranged from 14, youngest patient was 14 year old, eldest was 82. Two levels I've operated in one patient in 102 cases. And this is the distribution of endoscopic discectomy. L4, 5 and L5, S1, they were the maximum cases. About the complications in my series, there has been no major complication, no nerve root injury in this series. Minor dural tears in 35 patients. I fortunately, I never had to open up the incision to repair dura. There were minor tears which could be repaired endoscopically. So, never had to open and repair and everything on the microscope. Nothing. Discitis in one cases. 13 recurrences I've operated. So recurrences have been low. Some of them might have gone elsewhere, but 13 I've operated out of uh, 1,500 cases. So uh, outcome was good to excellent 93% of patients, fair in six and poor in one patient. This is just to show you example. This is a uh, L5S1 on the left side sequestrated fragment there, and this is the post-operative picture of the same patient. This is another big fragment centrally protruding. This is an inferiorly migrated disc which could be removed easily, not a problem. This is central disc L3-4 level. 
so you can operate everything so advantages of endoscopic discectomy are it is minimally invasive lesser hypogenic trauma smaller incision less painful early discharge from the hospital and quick return to the work this is a actual patient operated my operated patient you can see the size of the incision which is so small that it could be covered with a bandage so this is the actual incision and this is just to show you how the patient just before the entering the for surgery you know how he was walking here is shatika and this is same evening he is walking comfortably straight so patients are mobilized within hours and sent back in 12 hours so now coming on to the comparison with the routine microdiscectomy clark and foley they performed a meta analysis and uh, of uh, uh, difference between tubular microdiscectomy which included both microendoscopic and microscopic tubular discectomy and routine microdiscectomies and uh, in 2017 it was published in journal of neurosurgery and they found 10 manuscripts where this analysis difference was analyzed and six of them were randomized controlled trial where they had divided cases into med and uh, microdiscectomy and four uh, retrospective comparative studies and this is the number of cases one thing important to note is that most of these studies are quite small 50 or less than 50 cases so really i feel even 50 is just a learning curve for status maybe after 50 100 only you get enough experience that you can master the technique but uh, so in this comparison what they have analyzed the complications you can see most of the studies were they were the same csf leak again same 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 reoperation rate same 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 and they are randomized control trials recurrent disc herniation in one study there is slight increase otherwise most of the studies same infection decrease in some studies and some studies just the same and uh, estimated operation time is almost same in one in two study it is increased in some studies yes, it is increased estimated blood loss again reduced in uh, time to mobilization again same analgesic use it is decreased length of hospital stay same or decreased short term outcome it is same in both endoscopic and microscopic and long term outcome again it is same so the result from their uh, meta analysis is that similar clinical outcome can be expected from both endoscopic and standard microdiscectomy overall rates of complications were no different in med and standard discectomy like dural tear and recurrence equivalent operating time for both the procedure lower blood loss and shorter hospital stay was associated with med post operative analgesic use has been shown to significantly lower after med and infection rate is lower after med they say infection rate is quite low with med probably due to a smaller incision and uh, uh, less dead space so infection rate is quite low in comparison with the open discectomy this is the cochrane review published in 2014 where they have compared minimally invasive discectomy versus micro discectomy in minimally invasive discectomy they have uh, included both tubular and percutaneous transpyramidal discectomy and really they found no significant difference between minimally invasive and uh, micro discectomies and uh, almost same outcome they have reported little advantage here and there but uh, no clinically significant advantage this another published from paper published from india where they have compared med with the uh, micro lumbar discectomy and they have also found no difference between the two techniques in the outcome this is another paper published on china and they found a good outcome with med this is uh, from mumbai micro endoscopic lumbar discectomy they also reported a good outcome as with micro discectomy this is another uh, meta analysis published 2019 journal of neurosurgery where they compared endoscopic discectomy with microdiscectomy and tubular microdiscectomy 
and outcome of tubular microdiscectomy and open microdiscectomy for lumbar disc herniation are largely equivalent this is what they concluded so here is one paper they have studied various uh, inflammatory markers with med and non med and here they found some lower level of inflammatory response and reduced invasiveness in med cases so their endoscopic surgery clearly scope uh, scores over microsurgery in my opinion here you have a definite smaller incision it is very important especially it is more important in younger patient in our country where marriageable age we have a system of arranged marriages people are very concerned about cosmetics and they don't like any bigger incision it is certainly less traumatic it is very good in obese patients because in obese patient if you want to do micro discectomy you really have to make a big cut to go to the depth so here the incision size remains the same to a tube you operate for however obese patient the incision size is still the same contralateral decompression you can do far better with the endoscope than microscope then why is med lagging over microscope the problem is steep learning curve and lack of training because it to learn it that is probably i feel that is where it is lagging so to conclude for lumbar discectomy level 1 evidence supports equivalently good outcome for both tubular microendoscopic discectomy compared with the standard micro discectomy and level 1 data indicates similar safety profile and may indicate lower blood loss for tubular microendoscopy discectomy however further study should be conducted for the comparative value of these two procedures and before i end i'll quote a statement from clark and kevin foley's article Uh, they have very nicely written that novel techniques have become the gold standard in the face of level one evidence, demonstrating equivalence to the prior widely accepted technique. That means, like most notable standard microdiscectomy itself, the Cochrane review has demonstrated clinical equivalence of microdiscectomy to open discectomy. Prospective randomized controlled uh, prospective randomized studies have also demonstrated similar clinical outcome. pain medication use complication and hospital stay still microdiscectomy has become a gold standard while the outcome with the previous techniques were still the same likewise level 1 evidence demonstrates equivalence between instrumented and non instrumented lumbar fusion with respect to clinical outcomes complications hospital metrics and fusion rate still the instrumented one has become a gold standard these days so these data highlight how in the setting of equivalent outcomes technological advances and shifting patient's preference can guide changes in the treatment in modality that is to show that microendoscopic discectomy is showing equivalent to the as per present scientific data it is showing equivalent result to the micro discectomy so maybe in future because of better acceptance and widely availability it can become a gold standard maybe better training so if you push for it maybe in future it can become a gold standard thank you very much thanks for the patient this thank you sir so, professor chawda uh, that was a very uh, comprehensive sort of elaboration of all the great work that you have done and of course a very extensive discussion on the literature as well i would now invite uh, the panelists uh, to sort of take up the uh, discussion further uh, can we request dr rohidas to give his comments please hi satnam hi why do you feel that you want to change it change it means what you change you uh, change uh, micro discectomy the modification of easy go and descend in comparison to it is a modification of descend you to easy go you have created a more space inside the inner tube yeah. just like a easy go yeah instead of angle scope you are using a zero, zero degree. degree 
So uh, I am happy. I am happy with my system. I am very happy. I am using. No, but that. I, I, the, the youngsters would like to know why you want to change it. Make why I you thought of changing it? No, changing my scope. But you don't like this thing, or with the standard, or with the easy go. You, you, you have modified the distend. You think it huh. is a it is a combination of a easy go and distend. You correct? Yeah, yeah. The my youngster will, will like to know why you right. thought of modifying it. Yeah, I, I explained it my this thing because the it now my tube is smaller in diameter, so in season becomes further small. and it is easy to manipulate the instruments in that tube because it's an open tube no fixed channels so you can change like in the and uh, normal micro surgery you change move, move your hands like this change the angulation you cross the instrument sometimes you use suction as retractor you are sucking still uh, with the same suction you are retracting the nerve root little bit and performing the doing the surgery so it's like micro neuro surgery but while it is not possible with that system i felt so so this is what i am showing you my experience i think you might be having different experience but that's my experience so no, the youngster would the youngster should learn the, yeah. the basic philosophy behind it yeah yeah i told you that because like you can change the angulation you can cross the instruments you can use normal bipolar all those things are there after doing 2000 cases do you think the size of the incision in millimeters matters or what you do at the site of the pathology matters that is a question what micro discussion people ask us no no us <laughs> not about the endoscopic thing anything <laughs> uh, anything that is that is that is the whole topic was that okay comparison between micro discectomy and this so even uh, if we really reduce incision by 2 mm if i can do something with 5 mm now dr sukumar will talk he will give a 5 mm incision and then he would say that is better so that, that is so what the, the every the, mm the, counts every millimeter counts no that is what the youngsters should know yeah should they compare now, the next talk will be dr sukumar you say 5 millimeter what incision. happens at the site of the pathology during surgery which is important this too we yes. have to achieve that goal that goal is ultimate so goal is, is the most is important, the important thing not the incision in millimeters is dr sinha there is dr sumit there sumit sinha yes, sir <laughs> yeah a very important discussion yes. actually uh regarding this uh, size of the incision so uh, <laughs> very rightly said i mean the size of the incision does not really matter actually what matters is that your patient should benefit from the type of the surgery and the kind of the surgery that you are co going to do on your patient and uh, so that you do not have to see the sad face of a patient in your clinic in the follow up so that is the most important thing that a young delegate young practitioner has to understand now coming to the modification the question which um, uh, dr rohidas um, was asking i uh, repeatedly from dr satnam i mean um, uh, as to what was the need for modifying this instrument so uh, if you ask me uh, as a newcomer about some maybe 8 to 10 years back when i started using this uh, destendu system uh when i started when i first saw this destendu system i was quite intrigued with the system uh, and uh, uh, a sort of uh, you know not uh, very comfortable using this system in the first uh, instance why so the reason was that uh, the, the 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 reason was given by dr satnam only uh, who i also felt that uh, we as neurosurgeons working under microscope has we have grown up using the instruments in a parallel uh, fashion like this off and on on and on on and on like this not like this actually which happens quite frequently in the destendu system so this is a quite of you know difficulty in accepting that system i am talking about the destendu system so probably that was the reason that people switched over to easy go those who do an easy go system or those who use the tubular retractor type systems so this was one particular difficulty which i as a newcomer in the end spinal endoscopy he uh, found in the destendu systems or similar type of systems which might have prompted dr satnam to modify this destendu into a more easy go like looking system maybe and this this was true in my case also and maybe in other young practitioners who start using this conical type of system 
what what okay. matters to me the most is the whatever type of surgery you do whatever endoscopy or open it is the result or the surgical outcome that your patient should uh, not come to the opt clinic with recurrence or non responsiveness of pain dr rashim please uh, yes, sir. so the only thing i find like uh, interesting is like by changing the uh, the instrument from a circular to elliptical mm -hmm. it like it addresses the facet hypertrophy problem which might be there when the facets are hypertrophied the circular tube it certainly like poses some problem like uh, when the uh, facets are hypertrophied the elliptical tube rests nicely on the lamina so this is all like i feel so thank you thank you very much i think we have to honor the time uh, and give time to the other speakers So with professor Ashish, Professor Ortel is already there. Right. Uh, I don't so know whether he. If he wants to start his talk, you can introduce him and go ahead. Please. Yeah, sure. So is he around? Joachim, are you connected or you're not connected? No, I'm connected. I can. I don't. Are know you ready for your? Us. Are you ready for your talk or uh, shall we? Oh yeah, we can do it. Whatever you want. Okay, fine. So let us do it then. Okay. Are you okay? All right. friends all right friend uh, you know uh, it is my privilege to introduce joachim ortel he is well known to all of us uh, and he is well known to uh, our indian neurosurgical uh, societies and endoscopic societies in particular he is presently chairman at uh, neurosurgery department at the university of saarland which is hamburg in germany uh joachim has been very active in uh, development of the neuroendoscopy right from uh, its beginning and he's very uh, actively participated in all activities uh, organized by the uh, ifnd uh, he had uh, a particular interest in educating uh, and training the endoscopic neurosurgeons and you will find him in all the Uh, hands-on workshops and seminars and uh, neuroendoscopic uh, workshop and uh, conferences all over the world most of the time he has a special interest in india over the years he has visited india so many times and helped us developing uh, neuroendoscopy in india as well uh, he has been an orator in our uh, conference two years back of the neuroendoscopic society of india uh, large number of publications and credits uh, and uh, book chapters and everything on his name uh, i wouldn't uh, uh, have time to you know enumerate all of them but he is well known to all of us and he is an uh, asset to the world uh, neuroendoscopy and it is really my privilege to introduce him today uh, welcome uh, joachim and uh, uh please uh, unmute yourself uh, and share your screen with us he is going to talk about the lumbar canal stenosis uh, endoscopic uh, treatment all thank yours. you so much let me see that this works so you see my slides yes yeah. we can and you can you can hear my audio yeah uh yes can you come little closer to the uh, speaker so that we can better hear like you this. better that's much better, better? this great okay. yeah yeah unfortunately we have we have uh, a lot of snow here and uh, somehow i have a bad wifi uh, over the last weekend so we will try to to make it as as good as possible well thank you for the nice introduction it's a real pleasure to be back in india although it's just a virtual uh, webinar series it's not a physical meeting and um I, it's a particular ple pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar series because i think the neuroendoscopic society of india is one of the very few who really tries to incorporate the spine endoscopy in the neuroendoscopic society so i think this is of a, a very particular and i think um, i congratulate you on on this uh, effort a lot So my presentation today is on about uh, is a lumbar canal stenosis and endoscopy. I have uh, well some disclosures which are unrelated I think to the the presentation today. 
And uh, this is where I'm from. So many of you have been visiting us already, but this is now, I used to work in Hannover, then later in Mainz, in the beginning actually in Greifswald. So, and now I'm here at the Southwest border of Germany, Homburg, it's an O, not an A. So Homburg, very small city, just 10 kilometers from the French border. You see here, this is Strasbourg, is here Frankfurt, Luxembourg, so in the Southwest Germany. This is the department. It's um, the, and this is the university campus. So here is the ENT building, the main entrance. And you see here, this is the so-called Nervenberg. So all the neuro subjects, all the neuro fields are here in this area. And uh, this is the uh, OR of the neurosurgery department. It's uh, spine uh, and, and surgery is, um, is a very traditional a field for the neurosurgery department because uh, when you remember that maybe Casper uh, competed with uh, Yasha Gill about the first microdiscectomy which was done in this uh, here at this university campus and uh, the development all, of all these Casper systems and everything was done here in this department. So we do about three to four hundred endoscopic procedures, three to four hundred MIS spine fusions in, in this department. Well, th this is what I, I meant. It's a particular pleasure to, to present this in the neuroendoscopic society because uh, actually spine endoscopy more and more goes into spine surgery uh, societies and it's not covered by neuroendoscopy uh, that frequently anymore. And I think this is a real pity because it's a, a wonderful um, field for application and a lot of cases we miss if we don't uh, continue with our research and effort to, to bring endoscopy uh, uh, of the spine in our neuroendoscopic societies. So um, the theoretical advantages is a very high magnification. You can look around the corner, which I think is uh, not that important in most of the spine applications. In most of the spine applications, we don't use angulated uh, optics, we use uh, straight optics or, or 25 degrees optics. Um, but when we do about, think about brain endoscopy, the look around the corner is very important. We try to reduce collateral damage. And I think this is the main advantage of using the endoscope in spine. And ideally we have a new surgical technique like ETV in neurosurgery or transfrontal and spine endoscopy in selected cases. Well, in contrast to other endoscopic indications, we have no preformed cavity. So we have to create our space to maneuver the instruments to bring in the endoscope. And in contrast to many other endoscopic indications, we have already very good results with microsurgery. So we need also decompression of neurostructures, a sufficient decompression. So we are, have a little bit of a dilemma we have uh, already very good results with microsurgery. We have to create a space to bring in the endoscope at all. And then we need sufficient decompression of real structures. But I hope at the end of my presentation, uh, I will try to convince at least part of you that the endoscope uh, will play a significant role in spine surgery in the future. What about treatment of deformity and instability? It's difficult. And uh, well, we can do MIS decompression, but most of the uh, instabilities we actually do open uh, with a microsurgical decompression and then fusion. So what are the advantages we use when we think about the endoscope in um, spine surgery? Well, we have minimal muscular trauma. And I think this is particularly uh, probably the most advantage, the most significant advantage to reduce the trauma of the approach. Then because of the high magnification, you have a mini opening of the dura end of the spinal canal. This is not that important for spinal canal stenosis. And I will, uh, this is my topic today, but particularly if you have a sequester disc prolapse, you just have a, sometimes a mini opening of four by four millimeters in diameter then you can just take out a significant big, big sequester disc prolapse. There's a significant patient demand and almost all spine cases I see in my outpatient clinic, they ask about minimally invasive procedures. It, it might be um, nonsense or not, but 
this is a significant patient demand uh, we have to cover. Superior so aesthetic results, less post of pain and faster recovery are the theoretical advantages. When we think about spine endoscopy, we have a very vivid controversial discussion. One is against microscope versus endoscope. One is tube-based versus full endoscopic. One is transframmal versus interlumbar. Um, I think when we look at this for the lumbar canal stenosis, actually, it's a quite an, an easy uh, discussion because we need sufficient decompression of the spinal canal. When we look at the status of evidence, microscopic versus endoscopic, there's so many data out there now. Well, most studies show that the recurrence rate and the complication rate is no longer higher than with microsurgery. We have immediately, we have some advantages. So less post-op pain, faster recovery, less muscular damage, less um, superior cosmetic results. But in the long term, we don't have superior results. Well, this is, from my perspective, not a problem. It's uh, actually, it's, it's good that we have no longer uh, higher recurrence rates and higher complication rates with the endoscope. So I don't have a problem if I don't have evidence that microscope versus endoscope, uh, one is um, better than the other in the long term. Well, now I want to show you the technique we use for the lumbar canal stenosis. There are so many various ideas and approaches for the endoscopic approach of the spinal canal in lumbar, and I focus only on lumbar today. You see tube-based endoscopic assisted, percutaneous shear, full endoscopic. All these different approaches are available. Um, there are two main dis uh, principles. One is the interlamina and one is the transfram. Since the lumbar canal stenosis, in, in, if it's a fear, severe central stenosis, it's usually a little bit above the disc level. I think the lumbar canal stenosis is best treated with an interlaminar approach. It's not a good case for it in a transfermal approach. So these are the various advantages, various indications we can discuss, but this is what we want to talk about today, a central canal stenosis with um, a significant narrowing of the spinal canal. What is the status of evidence with visualization? We have now all HD cameras. We need a rigid rod lens scope. And um, these suitable techniques, particularly with the uh, tube system, uh, regardless whether it's a descendant system, mesometric system, or it's an easy go system, is, it gives us um, the right armamentarium for um, treatment of lumbar canal stenosis. So with these systems, no tight selection of candidates is anymore required. Just an example here. This is standard definition to the right, HD definition to the left. So if you don't have HD, if you don't have a diamond burr, probably it's not good to start uh, the endoscopic technique for lumbar canal stenosis. You need some equipment to um, um, achieve superior results. So this is our, I just uh, collected the data for a two year follow up. This is uh, of a endoscopic uh, spinal canal stenosis cases. We have done all these with the generation. I don't think it really matters for the results with what kind of uh, tube system you use. Even if you have a, a shear endoscopic system, you can achieve the same results, but the more workspace you have inside the tube, uh, the better, and I think the easier it is to apply the surgical technique. Surgical technique is absolutely identical with positioning, skin incision, and dilation of muscles to the disc, um, endoscopic disc uh, surgery. The only difference is when you think about lumbar canal stenosis that we try to address the attachment of the a ligament uh, and the cranial part. So we do re remove the lower part of the lamina and then we detach the disc, uh, the, the ligament from cranial to caudal. This is an example here. You see, this is a typical uh, canal stenosis and this is a surgical example. 
We use a unilateral approach, two centimeter skin incision like this, and we insert the tube system. And then you address here the ipsilateral, um, the ipsilateral uh, um, uh, lateral recess compression and decompresses. And then you tilt the, the tube a little bit and decompress the contralateral side. In the beginning, usually we start with the decompression in the in the middle in the midline. Why in the midline? Because in the midline, as you see nicely here, usually there's a lot of space left. Even if a very narrow central canal stenosis, you have in the midline some epidural fat tissue, some random epidural fat tissue, so you can expose the dura and then come from medial to lateral. Why from medial to lateral? Because of the surface of the dura. It's the safest way to avoid CSF fistula. Why from cranial to caudal? This is from cranial to caudal. Why from cranial to caudal? Because the direction of the nerve root goes from cranial to caudal, from cranial medial to uh, caudal lateral. So if you go in the same direction from cranial to caudal, the likelihood of injury to the nerve root is less. So cranial to caudal, medial to lateral. And the last step, after we have decompressed here, the ipsilateral side. This is lateral. This is mid, uh, midline, medial. So after that, we have decompressed the ipsilateral side. We tilt the endoscope. I will forward it a little bit. We tilt the endoscope. And then with a 25 degree scope, we can decompress the contralateral side that we can really do a 360 degrees or at least 180 degrees uh, decompression of the post uh, uh, neural structures. So this is the contralateral side now. It's actually a little bit easier to decompress the contralateral side. The only thing you need definitely for the lumbar canal stenosis different from the uh, disc collapse, you need a diamond burr. If you don't have a diamond burr, you, you um, will not be able to achieve a significant decompression of the contralateral side without a diamond burr. So the technique is like this here. You can use a kerosene punch as usual, but when you go to the contralateral side, you drill a little bit, a little rim in here, and then remove the remnant of the ligament with a kerosene punch. And this is an example here of a post-op CAT scan, just to show you the technique that you tilt the end of the tube a little bit and get the ipsilateral and contralateral decompression. All this is done with a, well, one 12 millimeter skin incision uh, with this technique. We have a long follow-up now, uh, two years follow-up with the EasyGo second generation on 30 patients with the lumbar canal stenosis. It's actually, uh, not the most frequent indication for us, the lumbar canal stenosis. We do the um, endoscopic application a more, much more frequent in uh, lumbar disc prolapse and in uh, cervical applications. So the lumbar canal stenosis is the third most frequent indication in our hands. And one problem is that many of these patients had earlier surgery, and I will get back to this later in my final slide or the almost uh, last slide. And another thing is that frequently we have a significant facet joint pain with us. So when we have a significant facet joint pain, then actually we go for fusion. So about one third of the patients we have, we uh, present with spinal lumbar canal stenosis, we uh, fuse. And this is a, a quite a significant number. So a total of 30 patients, we have a follow-up. You see all, uh, all operations were made unilateral. So only one was done bilateral. Actually, this one um, had uh, uh, several segments. Um, so usually it's a unilateral approach. Then ipsilateral monosegmental and four ipsilateral contralateral monosegmental. So bilateral monosegmental and 13. Bisegmental, ipsilateral in 11, ipsilateral contralateral, so bilateral, bisegmental in, uh, with two skin incisions in one and bilateral contralateral, bisegmental in one. You see here, this is a distribution of levels 
So the most frequent level is L4-5, then L3-4 and L5-1. So pretty much the same as, as in any other study. Operating time. Well, operating time depends on the number of levels significantly. So the mean, uh, the median uh, operating time for one level is 55 minutes. I think it's a little bit longer than we would use a microsurgical technique. So maybe it's an additional 15 minutes, I would guess, per level if you use an, an endoscope. Uh, all these uh, procedures were done with the EasyGo set, as I said, and there was uh, 24 of the 30 used the green trocar, and five, the orange, so the green is the medium size, 80 millimeter, the orange is 50 millimeter, and in one case, we switched from the orange to the green. Uh, this was a patient with a very obese patient, and it was just not possible because of the depths of the surgical field with a small trocar to angle the instrument sufficiently. So there was not a sufficient decompression possible with a small trocar. There was no emergency stopping, no switch to microsurgery. And 50% uh, of the patients left the hospital within four days. So this is always a difficult evaluation since um, in, in Germany, we have um, all these patients uh, were treated as, as in-hospital patients. So th there's no outpatient uh, lumbar canal stenosis surgery. So all these patients stay usually at minimum two or three days uh, after, after the procedure. 60% uh, were um, mobile at the day of surgery. 97 were day by, uh, mobile at the first post of day. So most of them uh, were early discharged. With regard to paresis, pain, and uh, um, sensory deficits. So in this group, uh, 18, so two thirds had a preoperative paresis. Of these two thirds, 89% um, improved at the two year follow up. So it's a long follow up, and almost 90% improved or had no paresis at the last follow up. What about preoperative pain? Well, 100% had back pain, 90% had radiating leg pain. Um, two thirds had immediate pain relief, so they don't need any um, uh, further pain medication, even in the long-term follow-up. One third had declining preoperative pain, but they have uh, some remnant symptoms, mainly back pain, like facet joint pain. So, um, but overall they are very satisfied. Preoptive sensitive, uh, they, well, let me go back. There was one patient we actually fused subsequently. It was, it's not on this list. One patient, because of the persisting postoperative pain, we fused with a percutaneous uh, uh, instrumentation. Preoperative sensory deficit, 50% had a sensory deficit, permanent sensory deficit. And of these 50%, about 50% uh, had a declining deficit. 50% had no deficit on the last follow-up. So when we summarize our own data, there's immediate pain relief uh, in or decline of post-operative pain in 67% and respectively 100% in the last follow-up. There's no improved paresis in the long-term follow-up in almost 90%. We had three CSF uh, lead cases, all clo were closed endoscopically, and I will get back to this on the next slide. There was no root injury, no new paresis, no post-operative wound infection, no switch to microsurgery. And in one case, we had to switch from orange to green. And this is our technique for the CSF fistula uh, closure. You see here, this is a CSF fistula. You see that the achnoid membrane is still intact. There's a little bit of CSF flow, but not too much. I will forward a little bit. Now we harvest some um, muscle tissue inside the tube. We put this muscle tissue, which should be exactly at the same size as the CSF uh, fistula, as the CSF, um, as the dura, dura leak. This muscle tissue or fat tissue is then brought into the dural leak. pushed a little bit inside, 
just that it stays there. And then we apply a, a taco seal. So it's a trombine uh, coated gel foam. And it glues this uh, a muscle tissue on the drawer. With this technique, we have measured our uh, a time for endoscopic uh, uh, drawer fistula closure. It's two minutes, 40 seconds average. And so far, when we applied this, we haven't had any problem with a uh, CSF fistula later on. And this is what it looks like, even in such a case where you had the CSF fistula, you can really um, uh, close the CSF fistula immediately, uh, intraoperatively, and it takes only two hours, uh, two, two minutes, 40 seconds. So why and when an endoscopic approach to lumbar canal stenosis? And this is the difficult topic we, we want to address now. And uh, I will just give you some of my thoughts about this. Well, first, the area of dural exposure and dural decompression is almost identical with the microsurgical decompression. Yeah, it's right and not right. There is a significant muscular trauma if you do two or three levels despite the application of a tube system, yes and no. The only advantage is a smaller skin incision and smaller visible scar. I don't think that all this is right. It's not wrong, but it's also not right. I will try to give my, uh, my idea about this. The area of dural exposure and dural decompression is almost identical with microsurgical decompression, yes and no. The area of decompression can be identical. It can be identical if you really put the same effort and a high magnification, even if you do an open decompression, an open without, with magnifying glasses or without anything, you can limit the dura area of, dura, uh, of decompression and the area of dura exposure uh, as much as possible. But the tube application helps the surgeon to reduce the area of exposure. So because we use the high magnification and we use the endoscope, it's easier for us to limit the exposure. So if I do the same case with or without an endoscopic system, the amount of trauma and exposure does differ significantly. So I think the endoscope provides guidance for MIS surgery. It's not that you only can do minimally, can be minimally invasive with the endoscope, but it helps you to be minimally invasive. Second, there's a significant muscular trauma if you do two or more levels despite the application of a tube system. There is a significant muscular trauma, but it will always, almost always be less with a tube-based transmuscular system than with an open microsurgical decompression. So even if it's a subtle difference, it's still a difference. So the transmuscular approach is muscle spare. And the only advantage is a smaller skin incision, a small, smaller visible scar. Well, if so, it's still a significant advantage. Why not go for it? So a Cirobox cosmetic result is, is still a superior surgical result, although it might not be uh, the tremendous difference you, you think about. So when an endoscopic approach? Well, actually I don't do case if if I have a very significant scarring to be expected. So if I need a lot of manipulation, like we had a case recently last week, uh, the, the lady had already four procedures in the same level. So I expected this to be like hell, there was almost no bone. I wouldn't do this endoscopically. Second, I do not do it in cases which in, uh, expect to be extremely time consuming. So like if you do three, four, five levels, both sides, difficult manipulation, I think it's probably not worth to use the endoscope because the endoscope is for a cases where you need a even subtle difference gives the patient some benefit. Well, I do not do it in cases requiring a significant exposure for subsequent stabilization. So if we think about two levels fusion, I don't think that it really makes sense 
to do too much endoscopic decompression because we have a significant trauma to the muscle tissue later on. And fourth, I do not do it in cases which need an almost 360 degrees decompression. So if I have a significant decompression from the control side, like right behind the tecal sac, then probably it's better to have an open wide exposure. Well, those are actually now four uh, exclusions. All the other indications, I think the endoscope gives us superior results when you use it compared with microsurgery. So with careful case selection, I think the same outcome with less, same long-term outcome with less post-operative pain, less muscular damage and superior carcerotic results is achieved. And I'm sure that the endoscope will play a significant role in the treatment of degenerative spine disease in the future. And uh, now I wait for uh, your discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joachim, for this uh, so nicely placed uh, and nicely explained uh, uh, endoscopic uh, surgery for canal stenosis. Uh, before I start uh, with the panelists, can I ask you one question? Sure. How, how many levels do you go for, you know, uh, you are comfortable with when it comes to, yeah. you know, uh, dealing it's with- a, It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, I think two levels is fine. Three levels, um, if I sometimes still do three levels, but three levels, if you do three, four, four, five, five as one, you have a significant low doses, three levels is fine. Mm -hmm. If you have two, three, three, four, four, five, and you have no low doses, probably I would do a second skin incision. So the last case we had was yeah. three levels, and this, uh, actually, this case, I did a second skin incision. I, I feel more comfortable with this. The more you angle the tube, the more difficult it is, and the the, the, the more significant is the muscle trauma. All right, Dr. Roydas, your comments, please. Yeah, that's that's the thing because when we try to angulate the tube more and mobilize it more, the muscle mm -hmm. trauma is quite significant. And our primary goal is to minimize the muscle trauma. Mm -hmm. Also, the skin edges also they 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 get traumatized. So right. The natural lordosis, is if we can take help of that, then we'll be able to operate two levels for the same insulin. Yeah. Alpha S1 and any, is the best. Right. Any question to, for Professor Hortel from your side? Uh, uh, now, uh, okay. Before the endoscopic decompression, we were doing the uh, uh, open decompression with microscope, and there used to be tendency to fix it also because of the destabilization how the scenario has changed with the help of the endoscope where we are minimizing the, the trauma to the uh, nearby structures and we are able to stabilize. Uh, we are, we are I able think that's to, a very good question. We are able to question. prevent the destabilization. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I, I will, let, let me bring another example. Let me, let's talk about synovial cysts. Because synovial cysts, is a typical indication I use to fuse all the patients. Yes. Why? Because it's a cyst develop, this, the cyst develops because of degeneration of the facet joint. So if you just remove the cyst, the facet joint is still there, it's still mobile, it will come back. So let's say until 10 years ago, all the synovial cysts, I did a facetectomy, did decompression, and then fusion. And now we have done quite a number of endoscopic synovial cyst resections. And so far, we haven't had a single recurrence. I'm so surprised. So that now actually having have the, although of the development of the, the pathophysiology of synovial cysts, we go for MIS decompression and resection. And so far the results are excellent. So, because you can reduce the trauma of the approach, I think the more and more of the uh, uh, well uh, of the patients, uh, you can of the indications you can try to to remain minimally invasive without fusion. When you do two levels through the same incision or a separate incision, in between lamina you try to keep it keep intact. It depends. 
it depends. If they, they, they sometimes if um, we have a significant bony compression from the lamina, then we try to undermine the lamina and uh, you know unroof the lamina from below. If it's not possible, we do hemilaminectomy. I'm not so that it, reluctant to in, do hemilaminectomy if I think it's way, If the flywarm is detached nicely, the rest of the lamina you keep it intact. Yeah. All right, Sumit, any comments or yeah, question I, for Professor? Yeah, hi, Joachim. Right. It's always a wonderful pleasure to see you and uh, listen to your talk. And uh, of course, we met last in Jabalpur, and that was, of course, a face-to-face -face meeting. But now, post-COVID situation, glad to see you again. So, yeah, again. Uh, just one. Uh, uh, I was just wondering. Uh, I saw that. Uh, uh, your patients uh, improved on radicular pain, that is understandable, after the decompression in stenosis. Uh, your patients improved on back pain too. I mean, uh, that too without the fixations. And I hope you meant about mechanical low backache that these patients uh, were suffering from. And this was quite a significant amount of percentage of patients that got significant relief in the uh, mechanical low backache. So my, my, my personal experience is that, I mean, I, my, my personal practice is if a patient complains of mechanical low back ache, uh, he would be better off doing a fixation, maybe a per cube fixation or maybe whatever the patient's condition demands, actually. So what is your experience in this regard? If a patient comes with a back pain, do you still go ahead by not fixing it and dealing it uh, primarily by doing a uh, uh, primary uh, decompression. Well, that's a very good question, Sumit. I, I mean, if, if a patient comes and has only mechanical back pain, no claudication, probably I would go for decompression, uh, for, for fusion. Fusion, yes. But okay. there are a significant number of patients who do not want to be fused. Yes, correct. They think, well, there's narrowing, just take the narrowing and I will improve. Correct. And of these few, who do not want to be fused. Actually, I'm surprised how many of these benefit from the surgery. So I think we have to be careful, but I agree with you. If a patient comes, has mechanical back pain, no radiating pain, probably Correct. I think- I think your data, your data answers this question. I mean, this is the question of doing unnecessary fusions. Since in your data, a significant amount of patients, and I would say tremendous amount of percentage patients responded to the back pain also, where is the need for fixation then? Well, the thing is, if you have radiating pain, I think then you have a good chance to treat also back pain. If you had absolutely no radiating pain, yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure. I would still still go for the rather the uh, fusion. Okay. 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 Thanks, Rashim. Uh, I have a question uh, to uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Hurtel. Yeah. That you told that when when you have a like when you suspect a like lot of scarring, you don't go endoscopically. So my question is, when you have a recurrent disc where there is a scarring single level disc, not multi-level disease. So a single level re recurrent disc. So what, what, what are your uh, takes? Like you would like to do, go endoscopic uh, interlaminar discectomy or you would prefer doing a micro discectomy in that case? Well, disc is a difficult question because disc um, frequently you have recurrent disc and you don't have much scar. So then you can come with the endoscope. But here, my topic was in lumbar canal stenosis. So if you did a significant decompression, and then five years later, the patient has a re-stenosis, these cases, I think, are very difficult because really the, the, all the dura is, is, is adherent. It's very difficult to do endoscopically. So lumbar disc, I think, is different. Lumbar disc, I think you have to make an individual approach. Lumbar canal stenosis would you know, a patient who had sufficient surgery, not like any mini opening. If you don't have a lot of scar, you can still go even a second time. 
but you had a significant exposure with the, uh, the first surgery, I wouldn't do the second surgery so endoscopy. Do, do you, okay, do you advocate, do you Sorry, ad advocate making that. some extra like precautions doing, doing some extra precautions in doing recurrent uh, disc surgery endoscopically? Well, the planning. I, I like think what? the planning is the key the step. Planning, yeah. You have to uh, carefully analyze the data. We always do MRI at and CT just to see the bony structures because you know it's the easiest way is to get into operative in, uh, orientation when you have some uh, some bone you can orient on. So all these patients get a preoperative workup, which is well, more detailed than usual, and then we decide whether we do go another uh, endoscopic uh, case or not. Thank All right, you. the last quick question from Dr. Roidas and then we move on to the next uh, speaker. Dr. Roidas. No, no. Uh, do you really have seen restenosis after endoscopic decompression or microscopic decompression in lumbar canal stenosis? No. Well, bony stenosis, no. Sometimes what we have is heavy scar formation. Yeah. And this can be stenotic. And I have no idea when and why this occurs. No, but these. But this is, let, let's say, two, three cases per year we have. They had earlier surgery and then they come back and there's stenosis, but there's no bone. There's, it's just scar for some reason. But there, they come with radiculopathy or, or. No, no, no. Usually not radiculopathy. No, back pain. Okay. May I ask one question? All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask one question. What about, we are talking about less number of days of stay in the hospital, but in your case, uh, you follow three, four days rules. So that goes against the basic principle that one talks about, you know, endoscopy. Is, there, is there any well, insurance policy or any other factor which contributes to this situation? Well, in, in Germany, if you have an in-hospital patient, you have to have the patient at least for three days post-op. So otherwise you can don't get a significant, a, a sufficient reimbursement. This is, I think, a problem we have here. Um, also the, the post-operative care and then on an outpatient clinic, on an outpatient level is not that well developed. So it's very different from, from India or the States or everywhere. I mean, because- This is why I, I made this very, rather, you know, attenuated, subtle comments, because I think these, these data you cannot use. They're useless. I mean, in Absolutely. NHS UK, where I work, we are supposed to discharge the patient the very next day, at the most. Yeah, yeah. This is national well, policies. Roy, do you have something to say? Usually, no, this is not a problem. Your in, 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 in my setup, we discharge the patient second day. Yeah, yeah same here. Yeah, yeah. So it is individual the policy. Canal stenosis, think, yeah. If there is no removal of the disc, the patients are quite happy after two hours of this. Mm -hmm. It is possible, yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Joachim, for your uh, participation and uh, you know good discussion on this topic. And uh, Ashish, uh, shall we go on with the next speaker? Yes. I think. So it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Sukumar Sura. Uh, who is a very keen and dynamic uh, endoscopic surgeon, um, consultant neurosurgeon uh, uh, working uh, in Hyderabad. Now he has, uh, he is, his main uh, heading uh, for which the slogan is that he would go for everything pure endoscopic, means he, he won't even use the word assisted endoscopy or anything like that. Now uh, he has been specializing in the cutting edge full endoscopic surgical techniques for lumbar thoracic and cervical spine. And he has trained and proctored spine surgeons across the world. And there's the all, uh, he uses the term full endoscopic spine surgery. Now, his full endoscopic spine surgery includes microvascular decompression, trigeminal neuralgia, hemispatial spasm, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, navigation guided minimal access to brain tumors. He is also interested in functional neurosurgery, which includes epilepsy and deep brain stimulation. And of course, transphenomenal lumbar, th thoracic, cervical, transphenomenal foraminoplasty for lateral resistenosis, trans iliac transphenomenal L5S1 discectomy and foraminoplasty, laminoforaminoplasty, 360 degrees decompression of the 
spinal cervical canal, interneural discectomy and decompression. So all this, of course, goes to his uh, education and training, which is really uh, very illustrative. He has done clinical fellowship and training on full endoscopic assisted spine fusion under Dr. Saad G. Osman, Sky Spine Endoscopy Institute, Maryland, USA. He has done clinical consultation on full endoscopic spine surgery under the mentorship of Dr. Sebastian Rayton, St. Anne Hospital in Germany. He has done functional neurosurgery training again in USA. His clinical fellowship training on full endoscopic spine surgery under the mentorship of Dr. Anthony Young, director of Desert Institute of Spine Care, Phoenix. Is trained for navigation guided ultrasound in neurosurgery by Professor Germund Os Osgard uh, in Norway and surgical training on percutaneous endoscopic spine surgery from Dr. Gun Choi in Seoul. So you can see the way he has tried to uh, get around the world and acquire his skills. Uh, that is really amazing. He is uh, the consultant neurosurgeon of various hospitals. He has been clinical director, visiting surgeon. He, of course, is uh, very proficient in his uh, surgical skills and has earned a great name. He has got various uh, awards and professional achievements, which are long list, and I'm not going to elaborate on that. And he has been visiting various centers and demonstrating his skills in various workshops on, on, on various uh, minimal procedures in, in different parts of, uh, parts of the country. And of course, he has got innumerable number of publications. So with these uh, few words, uh, I can't make his uh, CV briefer than that. Can I request Dr. Sukumar Sura to start his talk, please? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Patek, sir, uh, for the introduction. So I thank uh, our uh, Neuroendoscopy Society, Professor Patek, sir, and uh, Sankla, sir, for uh, inviting me. So today, uh, the topic given me, it given to me is uh, to talk about uh, pros and cons in endoscopic spine surgery. So last uh, two speakers almost uh, gave a, a good uh, picture about uh, minimal invasive spine surgery evolution. So endoscopic spine surgery has evolved uh, uh, a great way in the last 10 years. So it, uh, every uh, day by day and uh, year by year, the, the advantages are adding upon. So next uh, few minutes, I just uh, uh, give a bird's eye view of uh, what endoscopy uh, can do. So any adoption to a new surgical technology, it's, it's a, a steep learning curve. It, uh, most of the time it has uh, uh, these phases. So the endoscopic today uh, is in early adopters where uh, there's a long way to go. So maybe in uh, coming few years, so we might uh, adapt it faster so that we can come into the, the, the what is a peak stage. So everyone asks me about uh, what is the best way, whether I should do or learn interlaminar or learn transforaminal. So both are complementary and uh, as a surgeon, we should know both techniques because uh, any central canal, as uh, Dr. Joshim said, the interlaminar approach is always better. For lateral resistinosis, either of the two, uh, either uh, transforaminal or interlaminar, depending upon the surgeon's expertise, Foraminal, extra foraminal, no doubt uh, the transforaminal approach is always better. So when you take interlaminar approach, again, we have a lot of uh, uh, training uh, curve, learning curve. So the first we should learn how to do a simple discectomies. Then we should uh, do a simple uh, decompressions. Then from there on, we should learn how to do a, uh, uh, what to say, unilateral decompression, going to the opposite side over the top technique doing a contralateral decompression. So this is a long uh, learning curve, but whatever we learn, we should learn the ideal things to do properly. So again, the concept of this uh, endoscopy, there is always a confusion whether uh, which technique should be called endoscopic technique, whether uh, it's an assisted endoscopic assisted technique or it's a uh, pure endoscopic technique. So I think uh, this confusion should be kept aside Whenever we talk about any endoscopic technique, 
the concept is uh, it's a, it's a percutaneous uh, technique uh, the technique i use it's a, it's a full endoscopic single core technique where it's uh, called wet wet technique uh, uh, when compared to tubular and other easy go technique they are uh, uh, dry techniques here we use uh, saline irrigation which gives excellent magnification visibility because of the uh, bloodless field and uh, as in other techniques we use angled scope uh, somewhere between uh, 25 degrees and 30 degrees the biggest advantage of this technique is it can be done under local epidural or general anesthesia so most of our my techniques i do under epidural where uh, no need to give any general anesthesia for especially the elderly patient and morbid patients so or multiple level patients or if i am doing a a uh, spinal fusion so then i use epidural anesthesia and it is least invasive as uh, professor joshim said uh, the least collateral damage with this uh, uh, muscle dilating techniques where you don't damage the muscle or other tissues so as i said it's a single tube technique where uh, it has a working channel the light source and the irrigation channel so it's a, it's a one channel which uh, the sheath acts as a retractor for us most of the time we use a radio frequency high uh, uh, frequency uh, radio frequency here and uh, we use a custom made or uh, endoscopic drill systems so as the main important discussion here is uh, the, what are the indications so I just want to show the scope of endoscope here so we can do simple uh, lumbar discectomy so either transforaminal or interlaminar all kinds of disc prolapse whether it's a central paracentral lateral or up migrated or uh, down migrated foraminal stenosis and lateral stenosis can be done central canal yes so the bigger advantages with endoscopy is you can do foraminal extra foraminal multiple discs in a young patient dorsal lumbar and upper lumbar disc the biggest advantage is the upper lumbar disc prolapse where you can't retract the fecal sacs with other systems here because the lumen is very small we can easily retract the the fecal sac or the root or if you are practicing transforaminal technique there is no need to handle the, the root at all or fecal sac at all dorsal disc yes, it's a big boon for uh, dorsal disc prolapse patients where we can avoid big fusions cervical disc a simple posterolateral or in a foraminal disc we can easily uh, do uh, the poster uh, approach where we can do lamino foraminotomy and uh, remove the disc prolapse annular ulcers this is a big uh, chunk of patients where patients have chronic annular tears uh, treated with conservative measures pain management with physiotherapy for long years still there are some patients where there is a lot of granulation tissue within this annular tears where endoscopy can scrape off all this granulation and we can use lasers or rf to uh, ablate this area and we have seen excellent results in such patients and there is a big set of patients called adjacent disc disease patients post fusion especially elderly patients 10 15 years post fusion they develop adjacent disease and they don't want a, a redo surgery or a, a extension of their fusion and they have only minimal uh, back pain with a predominant radiculopathy we can uh, use endoscopy as a, a good technique and again uh, discitis patients where a patient has a, a, either a post op patient or a, spontaneous uh, spondylodiscitis patient we can use this endoscope as a big boon especially the transforaminal technique to uh, scrape off and uh, debride the space and uh, start antibiotics and again uh, now we do a lot of endoscopic assisted uh, t lips uh, through transcambian approach and uh, there is a new technique called combined lamino foraminoplasty where patient has a lateral disc stenosis along with the uh, Uh, foraminal stenosis so we can do a uh, transforaminal and interlaminar technique together so avoiding a, a fusion in that patient and uh, as uh, dr joshim said if patient has a facet uh, induced pain back pain and patient doesn't want uh, uh, surgery uh, then we can uh, get away uh, with this, those patients with a simple endoscopic facet uh, visualized rhizotomies where uh, multiple levels can be done at the same time and patient have a very good relief of back pain so coming to transforaminal technique uh, uh, this is a posterolateral technique which we do through the cambian triangle 
which is bounded by the traversing route and the exiting route of that uh, level uh, with the uh, inferior end plate as a lower border. So this is a potential space where we can enter the uh, disk space. Uh, if a uh, problem, we can drill the uh, part of non-articular part of the superior process and enter the disk space and uh, tackle. And the advantage is here is we can uh, do a, a pedicle to pedicle uh, uh, clearance of any pathology and also lateral recess very easily. So with the available drills now nowadays, we can uh, drill very uh, easily the overhanging bone soft tissue and lasers can be used sometimes for hard soft tissue in the uh, neural space. So I'll just go through the, the examples of what I have done till now. For past 10 years, I'm practicing this. A simple patient under epidural analgesia. I do use analgesic dose, not anesthetic dose. Patient on motor power is still intact. Uh, then I just uh, go through how a transformal technique is done. So just marking, midline marking is done. Patient under epidural analgesia is speaking to the surgeon all the time if you want. So you can mark AP and lateral. And usually I take 12 to 13 centimeter. In average Indian patient, it is around 13, 12 to 13 centimeter. Put a needle. So once the needle is in place inside the disc space and put a guide wire on the needle. So here we should be taking care. Uh, the guide wire should not plunge to the opposite side. So with a small stab, a few millimeter stab, uh, maybe uh, around six to seven millimeter because the sheath is around seven millimeter. So you can uh, just uh, give a stab, pass a dilator over the guide wire. Just follow the principles of any minimal invasive procedure. The dilator should be passed along the guide wire. We should not tilt the, uh, once it is inside, just underneath the facet, you can uh, remove the guide wire because you're sure that it is just the uh, facet is holding the, then with a fluoroscopic guidance, just tap gently uh, in the lateral view, you can see. And once it is inside, you just tap it further. So you are inside the disc space. Then past the sheath, you can see the sheath facing the, the superiorly between the traversing and exiting route. The bevel should face like that so that we should not injure the uh, root there. So because patient is uh, uh, only under the analgesic dose, you can talk to the patient, ask him to move the legs at this point of time if you have any doubt. Most of the time, the dilator pushes away the exiting route so there is no problem. So once uh, the is inside, you can see uh, uh, the inflamed uh, annular tissue. So you can use the forceps to remove this. I'm using a articulated curette to just remove the, and there are um, multiple drills. This is a articulated birth, uh, which you have a hand control uh, with the 10,000 uh, RPM. So you can drill the facet if you want, uh, if it's uh, overhanging our foramen is narrow, we can easily drill the facet so that our uh, root becomes more visible. Once you are done, uh, correlate the MRI and then remove the fragment like this. So that's a fragment which is coming out. And uh, there's a, one more case you can see here, uh, the L4, L5 disc prolapse on the left side. Again, the needle is inside. In the lateral view, always uh, the needle placement should be in the posterior one third. Once the needle is there, dilator has been passed. So sheath is in situ. So the 12 o'clock is the posterior that is dorsum. Six o'clock is the anterior. Uh, Three o'clock is superior and uh, uh, nine o'clock is inferior always. So you can see here now, I'm removing the uh, disc fragments here. In this patient, it was on the left side. So I'm standing on the left side of the patient. Once the fragments are removed, so I'm just uh, coagulating the fragments. I just withdraw the sheath a little bit. I, you can see the horizontal fibers there. They are the uh, torn uh, annular fibers and some PLL fibers, which I'm cutting there. And 12 o'clock, you can see the epidural fat. So once the small fibers are cut, again, you uh, attain hemostasis. So now we are uh, a half in, half outside. We are half 
inside the disk space and half outside the uh, disk space. I'm using uh, uh, just uh, instruments to remove the fragment. So that now we need to, you can see uh, uh, I'm using a, a curved instrument to remove the fragment. I removed the fragment. Once the fragment is out, we should not be very happy because until unless we see the root and pickle sac, uh, we are not sure whether the complete fragments have come out. Now you can see I'm just coagulating the surrounding uh, uh, fibers. You can see on the 12 o'clock, uh, there are horizontal fibers and is the annular tear and I can see the fragment there. I'm removing that fragment further. I can see I'm still not seeing as a pickle sac. I can see some more fragment, some more fragment has come out. But still, I'm not sure whether uh, I have removed the entire fragment. You can see there is one more a small fragment is there. So, and you can see the good tear here. This is uh, uh, seen only in endoscopy where the pathology is seen here. Uh, you can see the annular tear. I'm working inside the annular tear. Now you can see the fragment has come out and you can see a thecal sac there. You can see the thecal sac pulsations there with the fine uh, vascularity. I'm just taking a bit of uh, the fragment, the, the annulus. You can see now the two horizontal uh, structures are uh, the lumbar artery and lumbar vein, uh, which run along the, the nerve. So just radicular artery and radicular vein, I'm just cutting that. So, so that here, because patient also had lateral recess stenosis, I need to decompress uh, uh, the root laterally also. So now I am, can see the uh, root partially. So you can see there is a overhanging tissue, the yellow ligament, which is lateral to the root that has to be removed. Now you can see I have removed the entire ligament, uh, the lateral to the root and the root is completely free. The fragment has come out and uh, the root is well pulsating with the pickle side. So this is the immediate post-op. I do uh, in all patients, uh, my patient immediately with the epidural catheter inside he goes to the post-op imaging, he gets MRI done. Uh, once a fragment is removal is confirmed, I remove the, the epidural catheter in the post-op. So, so most of the patients I get a MRI immediately. So this is a small stitch. Sometimes I don't put the stitch, but a patient is from outstation. I put a, a single stitch and send him home on the same day or the next day. So it's a, one more case, you can see an inferior migrated fragment uh, this was a case of a, a recurrent uh, case. Previously, he was operated uh, for a micro discectomy. He came with a recurrence. So again, uh, with the, uh, 13 centimeters, again with the same uh, technique, uh, went inside. And uh, so just uh, fast forward this. Uh, uh, here, again, uh, because it's uh, the 3 o'clock is on the superior side. Nine o'clock is inferior side. So once you debulk the fragments and withdraw the sheath, you can see at the 12 o'clock, I can see, you can see the, the superior facet and inferiorly uh, it's, it's a inferior end plate and a pedicle comes here at nine o'clock. So all we should work is in the lateral recess at the junction of a facet pedicle junction so that we can catch hold of that inferior uh, fragment. So now, uh, using the articulated uh, drill, I just uh, will uh, drill the, you can see I'm drilling the under surface of the, the superior articular facet inferiorly towards the pedicle. So it's just few millimeter drilling. So you can see, I'm just debulking the, the fragments there. Now you can see the lateral recess is opening up. So further, I will open up the lateral recess with further drilling. So now I will just drill a bit more. Now you can see that pedicle junction is seen nicely, correlate with the CM interoperatively. Now you can see I have uh, drilled and opened up the entire lateral recess. So now lateral recess is entirely open. Now I just catch hold of that fragment, which was inferiorly migrated and the entire fragment comes out. So once this is done, uh, the immediate post-op shows complete uh, removal of the fragment, no violation of the facet joint, and the uh, patient is happy. 
no fusion done. So for especially foramen and extra foramenal cases, which uh, Dr. Satnam sir showed us before. So with the, what to practice a tubular technique or a microscopic technique, we need to go lateral approach where we land on the facet and drill the parts and enter the foramen. Here we can directly enter the foramen with the medial entry and uh, then uh, remove the fragment. And you can see the post of the fragments have been removed without any violation of the uh, facet. You can see this is a video. So you can see uh, the root there and just below the root, I'm removing the fragments. So from nine o'clock till uh, one, one o'clock is the, the root, which is seen there. And I'm removing the fragment below the root. I'm just below the exiting root. Uh, the, uh, the sheep is landing just at their, that place. I'm removing the fragments there. So it's very easy because so there will be no uh, trauma, no handling of the root. And uh, the post-op uh, paresthesias are very minimal in such patients. So here, one advice is not to use uh, too much of uh, radio frequency where patient can develop post-op paresthesia. If a patient has a foraminal stenosis, this is a pediatrician, 65-year-old. He has an isolated radiculopathy, no back pain. So patient had an inferior migrated disc along with the uh, stenosis of the foramen. You can see the superior articular facet is boring into the foramen with the kinking of uh, apical ligament causing foraminal stenosis. So you can see pre-op, uh, the CT showing uh, uh, apical uh, part of the superior articular facet is causing foraminal stenosis. So with the 13.5 centimeter, uh, what is a entry, uh, uh, foraminoplasty was done on this patient. You can see on the left side, it's a pre-op on the right side, post-op. A uh, nice foramen is opened up without violation of the facet joint and uh, post-op you can see the sagittal images, the foramen is nice widely open. Patient complete relief uh, without any fusion in this patient. This is a CT, MRI of the same patient. You can see nice opening of the foramen. In the upper lumbar disc, for example, this patient, as she was a 26 year old, uh, recently married. Uh, so this patient came with a severe uh, back pain, with the groin pain. You can see such patient with any open surgery or any tubular technique or any interlaminar approach is difficult because uh, tackling this patient needs a lot of uh, fecal sac handling. So endoscopically, transforaminally, it is very easy. So, but uh, as we go up, we need to be take a medial entry. Here I took a, a, a nine centimeter entry. And there were uh, calcified annular fragments because most of the time upper lumbar has a lot of osteophytes, either they migrate inferiorly or superiorly. So the annular uh, fragments which were calcified were also removed and the fragment has been removed. And this is the parop uh, uh, end point of the surgery. You can see the, the root here. This is the, the L2 root, reversing root, and you can see the fecal sac nicely pulsating. Fecal sac nicely pulsating. The whole uh, end plate to end plate, uh, the fragment has been removed, the osteophytes have been removed. And uh, the wonderful, uh, uh, what you say, results of this surgery is uh, when you, I have a follow up of uh, this patient now. So you can see uh, it was done in November 2018, immediate post op, it was showing the fragment removal. And you can see in December 2020, recently she came for follow-up. You can see nice healing of the annulus with no bulge and uh, no uh, much collapse of the disc space. That's the advantage of this uh, transforaminal approach in upper lumbar disc. We can do any upper lumbar disc with ease uh, with this technique. Again, the dorsal disc, as uh, I have done a dorsal disc from uh, D7 below and not gone above. So, Challenge here is uh, the rib uh, has attachment. As we go up towards uh, D7, D8, uh, there is a rib uh, head comes in the way. So I have to uh, drill a rib in such patients uh, with uh, either a drill or uh, hand drills and enter the foramina. The advantage here is in thoracic spine, the exiting route is going 
away that is superior so you don't have a problem of exactly exiting root here and this patient presented with a severe radicular symptoms some physicians treated for uh, 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 psychiatric symptoms for this patient for a long time then she came to me and the patient was showing a peroneal stenosis with a, a peroneal fragment also i did a uh, endoscopic discectomy and peroneoplasty for this patient so i calculate uh, this case uh, with a uh, mri so it was 36.36 cm from midline to avoid uh, uh, a lung or a thoracic entry so you can graze the rib cage and enter the foramen easily here i drilled the uh, rib head here and uh, end point you can see the the this is a disc space the fragment has been removed that's a traversing root you can see at the 12 o'clock and i rotate the scope superiorly and you can see that's a, that's a exiting root so this is exiting root and the traversing root and foramen has been widely opened and the patient is very happy post op this is one more patient dorsal lumbar spine patient came with the paraparesis d12 l1 uh, prolapse uh, i offered initially uh, for, for him a spinal fusion but he was not willing he wanted to try endoscopy so i did endoscopy surgery for him uh, with the d12 l1 he had a big osteophyte you can see in the x ray here i uh, removed the to cut the osteophyte also and uh, his four years follow up now doing five this a thecal sac uh, removal of the disc you can see this a uh, nice uh, root and thecal sac with the epidural fat there upper and lower end plate seen nicely all the fragment has come out and uh, this is a immediate post op you can see the fragment has come out and uh, patient uh, paraparesis improved over few weeks and still under follow up and is doing fine so this was one uh, uh, thing i was talking about uh, the chronic annular tears we uh, being uh, coining the the coin last uh, few years back uh, it has been termed uh, annular ulcers where you see this high intensity zones in mri the patient comes with back pain most of the time and we treat them conservatively do physiotherapy do pain management but uh, there are large set of patients with they don't improve and uh, we finally subject them to spinal uh, fusions this patient is a marathon runner young patient 34 year old uh, husband of an our nephrologist he came to me and he said uh, you do as minimal as possible because he want to continue his marathon career so it was in 2015 i operated um, when i put a endoscope in uh, inside transforaminally there is so much bleeding here uh, i tried a half an hour to 45 minutes every method to stop bleeding but it didn't stop because the granulation tissue was so so much so i i did some innovation here i put a small foley catheter and uh, inflated that and uh, stop, <laughs> waited for 10 to 15 minutes to stop the bleeding then i took down the granulation with the radio frequency and you can see this is post op uh, in 2019 after 4 years is completely healed and the patient is now again are uh, doing a, a complete marathon again uh, he has completed two three marathons already so this is the this is the advantage of uh, endoscopy where this large set of patients we can offer them uh, uh, endoscopic debridement and uh, rf ablation of the granulation so they improve a lot then adjacent level disease you can see uh, this patient was uh, fused uh, 15 years ago for uh, uh, back pain and instability that level is okay for now the lady is 64 years a yoga teacher she doesn't want uh, extension of fusion she has adjacent level disease with bilateral radiculopathy so you can see a disc prolapse with peroneal stenosis so this patient i did a bilateral uh, decompression uh, and uh, did a peroneoplasty bilaterally and uh, this is uh, uh, the end point where uh, you can see uh, a thecal sac and the root nicely decompressed from pedicle to pedicle and uh, this is the exiting root you are seeing on the right side i am rotating the scope this is the dorsal root ganglion with the the exiting root so you can see the traversing root exiting root and the tissue between has been uh, entirely removed and uh, this patient uh, recovered well so the most of the cases uh, discretis can be tackled here in this patient 
this patient was a uh, renal patient was uh, underwent uh, uh, multiple uh, renal procedures patient developed spontaneous discitis and uh, patient didn't want any further uh, surgeries and we convinced them uh, because we patient was not getting better with empirical antibiotics so i did a transperoral decompression on this patient so to our surprise uh, uh, it was a uh, enterococcus and uh, you can see uh, putting a needle i am aspirating the abscess there it's a frank pus and which can be easily uh, uh, done with a simple technique patient under uh, this patient we did under local anesthesia uh, because we didn't want to uh, give him a, any chance of infection putting epidural catheter so this was done under local with some sedation so and uh, once the uh, pus was aspirated i did a uh, in a decompression uh, debrided the tissue removed the tissue for culture and uh, it came as enterococcus and luckily it was sensitive to uh, penicillins and uh, other uh, simple uh, drugs which uh, he re uh, recovered very well later so we also do transperoral uh, endoscopic uh, we call it as assisted fusion because we do a end plate preparation using endoscope then we use a cage uh, removing the scope so for this patient especially you can see patient has a uh, instability with a disc prolapse with canal stenosis so here we can utilize our uh, endoscope uh, transperoneally first end plates were prepared with visualized end plates preparation removal of uh, this one uh, with a uh, artificial uh, <clears throat> bone graft mixed with bone marrow pack the surface uh, the space with the uh, a graft then uh, place the cage appropriate cage once it is done percutaneous screws were placed then interlaminar approach you do a decompression bilaterally ipsilateral then go over the top so bilateral decompression so you are avoiding a fusion here so this is the cage insertion you can see this is the cage inserted with the graft after pack packing the space with the graft and once i am coming out i am seeing confirming this is the exiting route i have not injured the exiting route all my transperoneal fusions i do uh, under uh, epidural analgesia with uh, neuro monitoring so we have a series of uh, cases now we have done with neuro monitoring around 12 cases till now so the advantage is that whenever we are uh, uh, putting the cage inside if patient complains of pain we can see with the neuro monitoring whether it is a stretching pain or the neural pain we can easily identify and change our trajectories so this is a cage inserted and you can see uh, this is a post op uh, image this is a one more case again l4 l5 uh, instability with uh, disc prolapse so this is a, a sheet uh, which place inside we pass a endoscope do a disc uh, preparation and plate preparation pass a guide wire remove the sheet then over the guide wire we pass a cage with a neuro monitoring then once uh, the cage is inside uh, with a simple uh, standard percutaneous technique put the four screws and uh, fix it so patient uh, goes home on the same uh, day or the next day so this is the uh, intra uh, transperoneal scope we have seen uh, almost a wide spectrum of cases can be done with this uh, technique uh the interlaminar again uh, all this time we have, since uh, last one hour we just saw uh, the microscopic microendoscopic tubular and again uh, tubular uh, uh, endoscopic techniques and distendo techniques so this is just a uh, uh, one more uh, technique where uh, the concept is same but uh, here we uh, operate uh, under uh, irrigation and uh, most of the time the sheath uh, itself acts as a uh, retracting tool So again, it's the same uh, advantages as any other uh, endoscopic technique. Added to that, because of the irrigation, uh, we have uh, excellent uh, visibility and the positioning same. And uh, here we can do either under epidural or uh, under GA. So if it is uh, uh, fusion, I do under epidural. Uh, otherwise, uh, I do under GA because uh, if I am doing a stenosis, it takes longer time. sometimes patient uh, find difficult to lie down 2 3 hours uh, on this uh, position so just uh, for example uh, how a simple discectomy is done is uh, 
alpha S1 disc prolapse with uh, radicular symptoms. Young lady, uh, 24 year uh, nursing staff. So marking is done. The advantage of this technique is only two to three CM shots are required. In transforaminal technique, uh, there are more uh, CM shots. And here, just one dilator. And uh, after that, uh, use a, uh, the sheath, which is a 8 mm sheath. So only the 8 mm uh, compared to other uh, techniques, it's 8 mm sheath. Once uh, this is there, you can see here the irrigation port. This is one more suction port. And uh, this is the working channel, the light source and the camera system. And uh, there's a way you hold it is ergonomically where your hand should not paint and you can do up and down like this. The advantage is you can steer it as you like, superiorly, inferiorly, and uh, medially, laterally, very easily. So once uh, this is done, you can see here, it's a small uh, muzzle bits you can see here, just coagulate, and uh, you need to remove uh, two or three millimeters of uh, the muzzle, uh, just to, once, because the sheath is very small, it is easily accommodates in between the uh, interlaminar space, you can, the moment I remove a small bit of uh, uh, muzzle, you can see the yellow ligament there. So you can just coagulate the bleeders and you are seeing the yellow ligament already. So once you see the yellow ligament, you just uh, uh, give a small uh, cut in the yellow ligament. Once you cut, you can see the saline itself will push the structures down and you can see, visualize and cut. You can see, visualize and cut. The advantage is you can take the scope as near as possible. That's the biggest advantage of the, this technique. The endoscope can be taken as near as possible. You can see the fine globules of fat is seen and uh, the vessels over the nerves are seen so clearly. And you can just remove that fat to just identify the lateral edge of the root. You can see, now I am seeing the lateral edge of the root. And with the sheath itself, just push the sheath inside and use this sheath as a retractor. You can see the lateral edge, that's the lateral edge of the root. And I'm using this sheath, pushing the sheath just deeper uh, and uh, using that as a retractor. You can see just I rotated it and my root is retracted now and I'm just free to operate in the disc space now because there is no uh, root uh, and uh, there is hardly any retraction. So advantage of this, one more advantage is that you don't uh, retract too much here and just put a nick there and uh, cut the lamina and do a discectomy. So, so one more example of inferior migrated disc, you can see inferior migrated disc. Again, the left side and complete disc has been removed. Stenosis, as Dr. Joshin already showed, uh, uh, wonders can be done with this uh, endoscopic interlaminar approach. The added advantage is that you can see into the corners you can see one example, this lady has a, a stenosis with no back pain. Most of the symptoms were claudication symptoms. So you can see here, uh, there is a less disc, more of yellow ligament component here. And again, uh, using a stenoscope, uh, which is a, a 10 mm uh, dia. So I just uh, use a 10 mm uh, sheath here. And this is the end point. Once I've done an ipsilateral and contralateral decompression, you can see this is a contralateral. I'm just sitting on the top and you can see this is a contralateral a lateral recess, completely decompressed. Nicely thickal sac is seen. That is a root where there's a disc space. That's a root, that's a disc space there. Completely decompressed. This is superiorly. Superiorly, entire sublaminar yellow ligament has been removed completely. It's uh, the spinous process underneath the, the spinous process. And I'm coming to the ipsilateral uh, lateral recess now. And uh, me, Dr. Dr. Recess. Dr. Surat. It's ipsilateral uh, uh, recess. Completely, you can see the root here. It's a root with some, uh, that's a root. Completely lateral uh, border of the root is seen. So you have decompressed the bilateral lateral recess. The central canal has been completely decompressed. So with the good irrigation and uh, the radio frequency, that's a disc space. 
and inferiorly you can see completely ligament has been removed so there is no ligament and uh, the overhanging facet can be easily uh, removed so Dr. this Sura? is the end point and you can see immediate post op shows posteriorly the complete ligament has been removed and uh, the entire can central canal has been decompressed facet can you conclude this thing dr sura please over i have done yeah. around uh, seven cases till now uh, and uh, luckily there are no recurrences and uh, uh, there no uh, need for any fusion so again uh, this uh, right uh, side radiculopathy this is a 78 year uh, male who was a uh, air force uh, pilot before uh, in world war 2 uh so he came to me uh, with the severe uh, radicular symptoms you can see here uh, the facet cyst has been decompressed as a material uh, which is there he was given a epidural uh, steroids twice but no improvement and uh, there was percutaneous uh, ct guided aspiration was also attempted on this patient once the cyst was removed i just decompressed the entire lateral recess you can see the the root there the lateral recess has been completely decompressed uh, facet cyst has been removed uh, and uh, you can see here the root is completely free and uh, this patient was very happy post op he stays in uh, united states now and uh, the two years follow up he is happy now and uh, the no re no recurrent symptoms so the complete cyst has been removed uh, and in such a old man no need to do any big procedures so limitations uh, till now we discussed the the scope or spectrum of uh, what endoscopy has uh, achieved or uh, has grown over the past uh, years uh, the but still uh, the cons are uh, the big learning curve adapting uh, to a open surgery or a fresher adapting uh, to endoscopy learning the the depth perception the 2d 3d anatomy and the the coordination of instruments the gentleness of the instruments uh, is very important in endoscopy we break the instruments uh, quite often and uh, the cost of initial setup and the recurring cost especially the i uh, get a calls by so many beginners saying that they broke their scope and it is costing them uh, uh, very huge money and uh, the instrument once there is a breakage of the instrument uh, it is very costly so these things over a period of years initially even first my two years of surgery i broke uh, two scopes and so many instruments but uh, last uh, eight years uh, so luckily i am not uh, had any such issue but uh, yes this is a problem where uh, the cost of initial setup and recurring cost and uh, the proper training as dr satnam sir said uh, in india and abroad uh, the structured or comprehensive training is lacking low uh dr uh, rohida sir has uh, taken so many pains for past almost 20 years uh, to teach people hand held uh, so many students to train them but still uh, there a lot of uh, uh, scope and uh, efforts are still required to uh, uh, train uh, the people so the learning curve and training are the big uh, cons of this uh, technique but i hope for next coming 5 to 10 years we achieve that and uh, have some uh, structured uh, training and uh, uh, reduce this learning curve so thank you uh, for the opportunity again thank you dr sukumar thank you. Uh, that was uh, a very elaborate uh, uh, demonstration of your skills no doubt uh, we can see the excellent results any questions uh, uh, should we ask uh, professor oetel to comment on on the talk or any questions he wants to ask hello so any actually, questions sir um yeah. i think my, my major concern is if if you want to tell beginners what is the case you want to start with and what is the case you do recommend not to touch just simple simple cases just simple as uh, description i am not able to hear i am not able to not able to hear with the cases you would tell the beginners to start with and with the cases you'll tell the beginners not to do i think he is not able to hear yeah yeah now i am able to hear sir yeah sir i didn't get the question i didn't hear it 
the question is for the beginners what would you suggest which are the cases they would start with and which are the cases they should not do thank uh, you yes sir for beginners i always suggest they start with the transforaminal technique uh, selecting a simple uh, disc prolapse which is acute disc prolapse uh, not uh, taking any uh, cases which have a stenosis component or a, a chronic component so uh, ideally a simple uh, disc prolapse which is very acute uh, in a young patient he is the best ideal case for a uh, transforaminal technique he is ideal case for a uh, beginner what what is the case you will not you recommend not to do <laughs> so uh, definitely uh, the degenerative cases and the stenosis cases are not for the beginners uh, once uh, they are uh, well versed with the anatomy and instrumentation uh, then they can uh, uh, try endoscopy in such cases the advanced uh, cases like stenosis in the form of lateral recess foraminal stenosis but patients who have predominant uh, back pain with uh, uh, degeneration these patients uh, if you don't uh, try to uh, address the pain generator if patient has a component of facet disease component of discogenic pain and a component of stenotic pain and if you only do a disc decompression such patients uh, will come back with a lot of uh, pain uh, residual back pain or a new pain so such patients so always the hypothesis of pain should be very clear that where is the pain coming from without that i don't think i uh, we should not attempt endoscopy and uh, i say we should not try endoscopy in all cases i see patient i see uh, beginners uh, posting me Uh, that can i do endoscopy uh, very difficult cases so every case is not a case for endoscopy uh, even i do open cases uh, even now today uh, multiple level disease lot of facet arthropathy some uh, predominant back pain i still suggest go for uh, uh, open uh, decompression and uh, uh, fixation rather than a isolated uh, endoscopic surgery thank you What? Why? Why do you have time for two more questions, or is it is it time up? No, no, please. No, go ahead, please. Go please. ahead. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Another question. There's a there's a big discussion here, at least in in Germany and in Europe, about the transforaminal technique. One prefer the inside out, so they enter the disc, do discography, and then they retract. and the others say well never do this because then you per perforate the annulus and you make a huge hole and the results will be bad so what is your opinion about this uh, i practice uh, uh, i practice in between <laughs> see because i am a neurosurgeon started with my career with uh, microscopic surgeries so well, we do in microscopy we do a small uh, lame approach to say annulotomy and uh, with the criss cross annulotomy we enter the disc and remove it and if you have any osteophytes around we try to break this osteophytes and clear the neural structure from end plate to end plate we don't want any structure to compress the narrow root so this is our concept right so when we are practicing endoscopy when you say only enter the disc and debulk it then you are wrong only go outside and remove the fragment which has popped out then again it is wrong because when you are removing uh, uh, when you do a follow a outside in technique and you remove only a fragment which has come out there are multiple fragments which are lying deeper just below the annular tear and you might miss those fragments and with endoscopy and angular scope it is very difficult to hold the deeper fragments at the same time when you have entered a disc deep inside it is very difficult to operate uh, just below the root so i follow a uh, what to say modified technique where i enter the disc space come out a little bit do a small annulotomy and find out the narrow root and remove whatever underneath the narrow root from top to bottom that is upper end plate to lower end plate clear the narrow root make it free in all cases so that i am not leaving anything there and it's like same as our micro discectomy only advantage is that here you are not violating you are not uh, retracting the nerve 
you are going underneath them now and a big advantage like a central disc or uh, like a big uh, disc like causing cauda equina syndrome you are entering the disc and pulling the disc from inside so it is very easy without handling any neural structures you are able to remove the uh, uh, material so to answer to your question the debate always is there and uh, people who are pro promoters of outside in and promoters of inside out they keep debating and they keep fighting but the bottom line is if you don't uh, de decompress the neural structures and remove the loose fragments we are bound to have a uh, recurrent fragments or a residual back pain post op okay one more question um if we sometimes we have patients who suffer from a disc prolapse for many months or years so do you do like a, a routine workup if you suspicious if it's suspicious of calcification do you do cat scan in all the cases or or how what, is there a particular criteria if you have a long standing disc problem not rather to go to open because we know this that sometimes even even the the myth of of interdural disc prolapse i mean this is sometimes it's interdural but only if it has been many many years thinning out the dura and then migrating inside is there any thumb rule you you would say well i do not do this endoscopically because i expect it to be difficult uh when i suspect uh, uh, osteophyte uh, which has formed over the period of uh, years whether a complete osteophyte or a partial osteophyte uh, there are two types of patients where uh, the osteophyte itself causing the the stenosis or uh, there is a breach in this osteophyte somewhere either inferiorly or superiorly and acute fragment comes out through that uh, space and further causing acute symptoms on chronic uh, disease so if such is the case uh, most of the time with the uh, disease is chronic and in mri you see lot of uh, hyper intensity uh, signals uh, on the disc uh, surface i do a ct scan uh, to rule out uh, the uh, morphology of uh, osteophyte and in the such cases i go interlaminar rather than transforaminal because uh, in transforaminal technique it is difficult to remove a thick osteophytes so i go interlaminar break all osteophytes and with interlaminar uh, stenoscope you can break all the osteophytes and remove the entire uh, fragments very easily because uh, uh, you are just landing on the fragment landing on the osteophyte just retracting the thecal sac with the sheet you can just uh, uh, remove the complete osteophyte so i go interlaminar rather than transforaminal i i don't have any other questions uh, dr rohidas please yeah, he, he just uh, dr sura you just told that you with the interlaminar stenoscope you are happy with the decompression which you achieve but still you said that you still do some open cases yes what is the reason because uh, when i see a multiple uh, levels and if, uh, i see uh, facet disease uh, is a big uh, issue when uh, with the stenosis only you address the uh, canal and remove the ligament and the what is a bilateral root decompression with some uh, facetectomy on either side but still patient come, uh, come back with uh, the back pain because of the residual facet arthropathy or uh, micro instability which uh, uh, patient has already so such patients where uh, there is a uh, facet arthropathy i better uh, go for a open uh, surgery uh, open t leaf fusion rather so when when you think of a fusion you do, you go open open otherwise uh, no open sir I, most of the cases i do endoscope uh, dr sumit dr sinha are you there yeah 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 hello can you hear me yes yeah. sir okay uh, um, great presentation uh, dr suru uh, i mean it's it's wonderful i've been following your work for quite a long time now and um, uh, keep on seeing your post on whatsapp and facebook and all wonderful very uh, applaudable mm -hmm. uh, as you very rightly said uh, i mean not this is for the young practitioners who are listening over there uh, as you very rightly said that the operative procedure should not be done for the sake of doing that operative procedure and uh, uh, of course uh, endoscopy it is very very true for endoscopy endoscopy should not be done just for the heck of doing that 
um, they, we have to keep in mind, anyone who does an endoscopy has to keep this in mind that there are specific indications for doing an endoscopic procedure, be anywhere, be inside the brain or in the spine, or whatever disease you are doing the endoscopy for specific indications. If you outreach these indications, if you use endoscopic procedure beyond those which are recommended as ideal indications for that endoscopy, your endoscopic procedure uh, might fail and patient might not get benefit from surgery. Uh, now, here is an exception that all, those, all these presenters over here who have presented today, they are world-class. They are the masters in their technique. So this is a word for young practitioners. The kind of cases they show and the kind of surgical outcome they show for their cases may not be applicable to the novice. So the novice should do an endoscopy only in that ideal indication, at least to start with, if they want to have good surgical outcome and if they want their, their surgical patients not to return to their clinic without any uh, improvements. So this is my take on endoscopy. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Rashid? Can I, can I add something on this? Because yeah. this is yeah. a very important point. Um, yeah. I think it's very important that you know the anatomy. It's not that much the microsurgical technique. It's that you know the anatomy. So I think it's mandatory. You have to do at least 100, maybe 200 spine cases open just to know exactly where you are. Because the problem of the endoscope, regardless which technique, you don't have the overview you used to have with the, with the open approach. I think there's a very important aspect. If you don't know exactly where you are, Every technique becomes dangerous. So I think that's a very important point that we have to, to train the, the young ones that they know exactly what the, of the, the anatomy. That's true. Thank you. Thank you very much for those important words. Uh, Dr. Rashim Kataria, anything? To... I, I must uh, congratulate Dr. Sura for an excellent presentation and especially for the use of transforaminal surgery in upper lumbar cases. Sir. And I uh, must thank the New Endoscopic Society for this wonderful uh, like webinar. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Rohit wants to ask something again. So the, one should understand the pathological anatomy, what he wants to have at the site of the pathology. Suppose it's a canal decompression, what he wants to achieve, and then choose his technique. It should be reverse way for a particular case, what he wants to achieve at the site of the pathology. And then he, he can choose the technique other rather than choosing the technique and then going inside and then having true. Yes. Problems of yeah, I think not achieving it. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Listening to the patient, seeing the symptoms and then deciding with the radiology and then coming to understand what the pathology is. Yes. So, other, otherwise, each and every case is a different case. A different case. There is going to be problem. Great. I think uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, wonderful uh, uh, session today. Are there, are, are there any question in the chat box? Uh, there I are questions, but I think they have all been answered. Uh, I am with the questions here. Uh, yeah. So most of them have been covered in a different form. So okay, perfect. I'll hand over the uh, uh, mic to the president, and uh, we make the final announcements. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Patak, for uh, conducting the seminar. And I would like to uh, thank all the speakers. They have uh, presented uh, excellent uh, uh, material today, and we had a fab fabulous discussion today uh, on various uh, procedures performed. Uh, endoscopically on the spinal diseases and disorders. So thank you very much, uh, all of you. And uh, uh, shall we, you know, uh, invite Mr. Naik to to do the closing remarks? Yeah. If he's around. Good Mr. evening Naik. to good evening to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, you must have had a wonderful uh, learning session today from the experts from Global Scenario and from India. Uh, Professor Joachim uh, Ortel. Uh, this is the second time I think uh, sir has come to uh, educate the Indian surgeons and uh, the other speakers. 
professor chhabra and uh, professor uh, sura thank you very much for your presentation a lot of learning uh, that you have given to our young neurosurgeons as uh, professor hotel said it is anatomy 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 and first few cases has to be open surgery before you go on to the endoscopic uh, surgery uh, panelist asked very insightful questions to unravel the mystery of endoscopic surgery professor uh, rohidas we have been fortunate to have him often in our webinars uh, professor sumit sina and uh, professor rashim kataria thank you very much for your insightful questions and thanks once again uh, professor suresh sankla for conceptualizing this webinar series for neuro endoscopy society of india ably supported by uh, dr ashish patak uh, from health and you we have been fortunate to carry this session and enjoy this session throughout this is the sixth episode that uh, we had the opportunity to carry uh, we thank our uh, speakers our uh, panel members and the organizers and of course the viewers uh, have a wonderful uh, new year uh, and a great learning continued in this new year 2021 and i hope you get your shots of vaccines very soon and then it follows to us uh, thank you very much please continue to support health and you we are happy to carry this uh, uh, academic webinars we had 217 logins today from oh, 217 logins today from three different countries and ten logins have come from abroad so the numbers have been good in spite of so many webinars happening around uh, thank you very much for following this series from neuro endoscopy society of india uh, thank this you is, thank you very much bye. yeah thank you bye bye thank you, thank you. this is deepak naik signing off from health and you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you so much just ashish just to remind you the next webinar is on 14th of february and that would also have spine uh, uh, part of it so please don't forget to join us all right thank you thank you very much thank you have a good night thank you thank you